sports. I mean, there, I, in my opinion, there's nothing better that you can, you know, uh, experience in, in life is, is having kids. Um, it's, it's made me a better person. It's allowed me to grow up because I'm, and, uh, I'm in that fight right now with trying to manage my time uh, to have more time with them. You know, obviously, you know, all of us, you know, have, have pushed boats around and uh, it's, it's a very time demanding uh, career. Um, we've got a lot of clients that love being out on the water and want to be on our boats and, you know, we can, uh, we only have so many days that we can be out there. So um, I'd like to start doing the, the weekend thing like Jared's uh, talking about. Um, it's just uh, right now uh, that, that juggle and, and schooling and having to pay for that and getting them ready to, you know, put the money in the bank for college. It's, uh, it, it's, it's demanding. So, um, but uh, that, that's how it's changed uh, my priorities. It's, it's just made me a much more well-rounded person in general. I'm Greg Deeney. I'm Jared Raskoff. And this is the Tom Rowland Podcast. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the podcast today. Got some really good guests for us today. The hosts of Silver Kings. Jared Raskob has taken over Silver Kings, and he is one of the hottest guys in the Florida Keys by far. I mean, the guy catches everything in the ocean. And this year, he's going to be fishing with his good friend, Greg Deeney, who is also a Tom Rowland podcast alumni. We had a great show with him. You can go back and check that one out if, uh, if you haven't heard that one already to learn a little bit more about Greg. But these guys are teaming up, and they're going to raise the bar. I really believe that they are. They're great fishermen. They've got some great production people behind them, and they're going to be on Waypoint. And I'm really excited about all of those things because Waypoint needs more great productions on there, on there, and this is definitely going to be one of them. So stand by for a good conversation with Jared Raskob and Greg Deeney. And listen, there were some audio issues. I don't know what was going on with my internet, but there were some audio issues. We're going to try to make the very best of this. Um, and the guy said that if it, if, if it just wasn't working out, we're going to get them on again. So we may have some abbreviated conversations. And if that is so, and you notice that there were some edits or something, it wasn't because we we're trying to cut anything out from what they were saying or what I was saying. It's because the internet was really spotty and really bad. So this is one of uh, of, of a few podcasts that we're going to have with these guys. I love them. They're awesome. And uh, I, I'm excited to have them on the podcast. So here we go with Greg Deeney and Jared Raskob from Silver Kings. My two losers, dude. Terrible. <laughs> you want to try it again? <laughs> so, you know, I'm a kind of a, one of those guys that like the first take is what it is. You know, that's just natural. I'm with you, man. That's, that's it. There's no acting. There's no makeup around this joint. This is it. Yeah. What you see is what you get. That's it. I mean, make up nothing, just straight up, just love. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, that's how we're going to start this thing. We've started it right now. That's it. That was the intro. Can you believe it? There you go. <laughs> it? It should be. It that's is. It. So what are you guys up to, man? Everybody doing all right? Uh, we're Everything's great, man. Just, uh, you know, just fishing like crazy and these these boys like you guys all know having kids just uh completely priority shifts your life and in the best way possible but you know when you think you're tired after a day fishing it really like the, the game starts as soon as uh you go and pick them up from daycare yeah i'm i'm with you man i i, I know i watch you guys on social media and it just looks a lot like me a long time ago with my little kids um so jared what are the ages of your children I have uh, Rhett, who just turned two last week, um, and then Reed, who's turning four in March. Two and four. Greg, what's your situation? I've got an eight, a six, and a four. And, uh, man, they're making me age pretty quick. I can tell you that much. <laughs> <laughs> well, how did uh, the priorities change? That's what you first said, Jared, when you first, when you first were mentioning the kids. How did, how does your, how did your priorities change? You know, I mean, I think the biggest way it changed is I was always somebody that wanted to kind of stay out as long as I could. 
you know, the, the more time you can get on the water, the better you're going to get and kind of grow. Uh, you know, if you spend an extra two hours a day uh, over a year, you know, you basically gain another year, you know, and, and just kind of fast track things. And now that's not really, it's kind of gone to the point where, you know, fishing six days a week, um, you know, I still try to leave pretty early, even in the winter time. But, you know, I have a, a deadline to, to basically get back to uh, and that's to go and get my kids from from daycare and um, and obviously spend as much time with them. Not only, you know, do I have to get them, I want to get them. You know, I want to be with them. I want to spend that time. So I think my par- priority shifted mostly in, in probably my guiding. Um, and that was, you know, obviously a big reason why t- tournaments um, a few years back, just because, you know, that was just so much more prep, as you know, and so much more dedication and everything to it. And, um, I just didn't feel like my mind was in that place, but in my guiding, you know, it's, uh, it's still there. I still want to, um, produce for my people day in and day out. I want them to see that I'm giving a a hard effort and, um, you know, so I still do that, but, you know, basically being with those kids is, uh, is everything I want to be doing. And so I take off every Sunday now. So that's my way of kind of like getting, that piece, you know, that I might be missing in the weekdays is that I take every Sunday off. That's, that's my thing. You know, that's exactly what, what I did. My, my wife encouraged it, you know, encouraged it. Like now, now you're going to take every Sunday off. And, and that really became like something that was so important to me after a while. It was hard at first because like, you know, I mean, those are Sunday. Like that's the day that a lot of people want to fish like Saturday and Sunday. So it's like you're kind of not doing charters, but then that time with the family is is really super important, man. That's just, it's it's good to hear that you're doing that because not a lot of people do, you know. A lot of people just kind of. I mean, I think a lot of guides. It's tough to stay married as a guide. It's tough to raise a family as a guide. But if you get your priorities kind of in line, like it sounds like you have them, that makes a huge huge difference. So was that a decision that you you and your wife made together, or did you make that decision? No, I, I made that decision. Um, you know, everybody is like always kind of said, Oh, there's no love like a child. And, you know, you kind of, you hear it from so many people from my, my parents, friends, uh, maybe not from my parents. Um, you know, they, they, they probably say that about me too much, but, um, you know, but hear from everybody else, but the, it, the truth is it, it, it is reality, you know? And, um, so when I had the first, child read I already was like okay I'm gonna start slowing back on not doing tournaments and then I think it was like six months in I was you know I'd be gone for you know 10 days straight and then I would come home and I miss you know his first word sometimes or whatever you know and and steps and such big you know come things in their life and I was like you know what the extra the extra dollar and the extra time away is you can never get it back right you know and so um next year i'm moving into i think i'm going to take off every saturday and sunday nice uh, that's awesome greg was that has that been your your um kind of experience too when you when you move into the parenthood yeah i mean it, it definitely changes your priorities um i mean there, i in my opinion there's nothing better that you can you know uh, experience in in life is is having kids um it's it's made me a better person. It's allowed me to grow up and uh, I'm in that fight right now with trying to manage my time uh, to have more time with them. You know, obviously, you know, all of us, you know, have, have pushed boats around and uh, it's it's a very time demanding uh, career. Um, we've got a lot of clients that love being out on the water and want to be on our boats. And, you know, we can uh, we only have so many days that we can be out there. So. Um, I'd like to start doing the the weekend thing like Jared's uh, talking about. Um, it's just uh, right now uh, that that juggle and, and schooling and having to pay for that and getting them ready to, you know, put the money in the bank for college. It's uh, it, it's it's demanding. So um, but uh, that that's how it's changed uh, my priorities. It's, it's just made me a much more well-rounded person in general. Yeah. Interesting. That's funny. That's, uh, that's, that's so cool to hear you guys, um, you know, taking the time off and, and, and really valuing this time and and cherishing this time because I don't know, a bunch of old people told me that, Oh, you blink and it'll be over. 
And uh, man, now I'm an old person and I'm telling you that that can't be, there's no more truth than that. You blink and you're, I mean, my daughter's 17. Both my boys are living in Montana. They're, they're like 23 and 21 and a 17 year old girl. And I swear, man, I can remember like it was yesterday, like 15 minutes ago, it seemed like they were the ages of your kids. And that's what a bunch of old people told me. And so here's another old person telling you that that is absolutely the case. And every, every moment that you put, uh, it's like, it's like a dollar that you put in a, in a bank account, man, it's an investment and, and you will never be sorry that you spent that much time with your kids. That's awesome. I'm really happy to hear that. So the other thing I was happy to hear is that you guys are, uh, that you got some news. What's your news? Well, the news is, um, you know, the we silver Kings is coming on season seven. Um, and it's, uh, super, I'm super excited about the, the new partnership with one of my dearest friends, Greg, um, nice. somebody just a phenomenal fisherman, um, himself, but just had it for production and it for social media and everything. And, and the fact that, you know, there's just so much love in between us for many years I met when I was 20 years old in Louisiana. So, you know, we're coming on 11 year friendship and, uh, I think there's some big things that are going to be happening, uh, especially with Greg, you know, coming behind the helm um, of running things on um, back end. Nice. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and I'll tell you what, it's, it's, you know, knowing Jared now for, for, you know, the better part of 11 years and just watching his career grow up um, as, as a guide and, and the keys and just seeing what he's done uh, from a success level you know, getting the opportunity to work with a guy like that comes around once in a lifetime. And, um, you know, I'm just very fortunate to get the opportunity to, to work with Jared and Silver Kings. And I mean, we've got so many great ideas and, um, you know, the show is just going to go in a direction that is going to reach a lot bigger audience. And Jared and I are both excited to, to get the process started. <laughs> well, my main question is that I, I watched you guys there. You have a, you have a screen test, right? You have, a, you have like something that you can go show sponsors. You have like something that you can look at and go, yeah, that, that turned out pretty good. It's when you, you were a guest Greg on silver Kings and mm -hmm. I don't know, what did you guys catch? Like, like everything in the ocean that day? <laughs> like, I mean, seriously, like that is a pretty damn high bar. I don't, I, my question is how, how do you even hope to, uh, to measure up to that bar, uh, that you set? I mean, uh, seriously, that is like the most fish that I've ever seen on a, on a, on a TV show. You caught like a permit, a bonefish, a tarpon, a redfish and a snook. I don't know. Maybe you caught some other things too. It was pretty impressive. That's that's all to this guy, uh, Jared. I mean, he, he's the one that can find them. We we definitely talked about it before we filmed that show. And, um, you know, you just you never know. It's it's one of those things you catch one fish at a time. And if and when it happens, it all comes together. And it just comes together. Day. But uh, he that with that guy that, that knows what he's doing, like Jared does. And you can't spend too much time on one species. Uh, which is, uh, you know, Jared does quite, quite a bit of it. So was that day, um, was it like, I mean, there's plenty of days where you go out with customers and you're like, Oh, I caught this and this, and then we got a shot at this and, and these other fish over here, but it's different when somebody like makes the connection. It's different when somebody like actually converts a, an opportunity to a, to a, to a caught fish. Is it, was it that kind of thing that was happening or were there plenty of shots just an amazing day. I mean, uh, really, um, it started off, you know, just like an epic little tarpon morning. Um, I think Greg caught the first six or so that he hooked and, um, you know, all like between 10 and 20 pounds. And, and, but our idea was to catch a super slam, you know, and I was telling him as we were doing it, we're, we're getting sucked in, you know, I'm, I'm one of those guys that I like the variety of what the keys offers. And I like to, you know, go and, and try to challenge ourselves to catch as many of the main five species as we can on a daily guiding basis. And, you know, obviously we're, our idea was to do it. So 
you know, I remember I'm like, hey, man, we got to go. And, and Greg, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we didn't catch another species until 11 o'clock. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, right. right. And then also we came around the corner and I was like, oh, there should be, you know, healing reds right here. And also we're going to catch snook right here as well. You know, try to bang out both. And, and sure enough, there we had a pair of tailing reds only shot you know, that we saw that we at least approached and Greg caught one. And then we turned back around and caught uh, some snook on the branch. And then, and um, I remember before we could even get the camera crew set up, Greg is already hooked up to a bonefish on fly. <laughs> and, and we, and we, anyways, we, we, we knocked that one out. And then from there we made a nice 18 mile run up North, you know, uh, we're, we kind of like started to finish. I think we probably covered 90 miles. Um, and uh, we went up and Greg had a, he spotted a permit floating like 200 feet out off the bank. And he threw that grab like three feet in front of it. The thing came over and I watched him descend. And I was like, yeah, that's, um, he's only going down on one thing. <laughs> uh, anyways, we caught it. And it was kind of like, wow, did we not only um, did we just do that, you know, even if it was a fun day, but we kind of, did what we came out to do and uh, we did on film. Yeah, man, that's, that is, that's impressive. It's hard to do. I mean, it's hard to do. Like if that was a tournament day, it would be hard to do. If it, it's any, it's hard to do that. Anytime somebody just says, okay, go, you know, that's what you're going to do. Go. Like, I don't know. Every time we bring the cameras out, it does not usually result in the best weather and the best luck and the the most streamlined operation. It usually more resembles like i don't know there's stuff falling there's hatches slamming there's people falling in the water there's there's everything that would keep you from catching a fish usually um and then you're dragging a camera boat when you're when you're doing this whole thing that's that's pretty impressive man that's 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 one of the best days on film that that i i've ever seen and and i could also tell kind of throughout the day you're looking and you're like man that's the same day like somebody would say uh oh, uh, it took them a week to film that show, you know, but you can see it. You, like, you can see the, the light and you can see what's going on. And it's, it's obviously the same day. Like, it's pretty impressive, man. It's pretty impressive to do that once. Really impressive to do it on film. And that was your goal. Yeah. No, it was, it was, it was a super was cool. fun. Yeah. I'd rather done it with anybody else. All right. So how yeah. are you going to top that? <laughs> yeah. Well, I got some, I got, I got some ideas in my head to, kind of uh I, I like i like to do and greg this is gonna be a surprise because i haven't even talked this through with him but uh like i like to do the weird things like slam of like um a big trout on the flat a sheep's head on the flat a black drum tailing on the flat you know those those things are people go by it and look at it you know and it's like oh it's just a sheep's head i'm like in your mind i'm like that sheep's head's harder to catch than anything else that there is to catch on that fly and so if you don't throw at it, you know, it, it just means that, you know, some people are just sticklers or like kind of like stuck to the one, oh, it's a, it's a red fish. I'm like, but you can catch the big jack from the back of the red. That fight's better than that red fish, you know? But for me, I like the variety. So I would love to do like a, basically like a Cajun keys slam, which would be in my mind, a triple tail, a trout, a black drum and a sheep's head all on the same day you know, and kind of just switch it up and show people that there is, you know, there is cooler species. There's cool species all around us and you just got to just get kind of take what you get those days. Nice. So are, are you guys planning on, on going to, to Greg's neck of the woods? Yep. Yes, we are. That's definitely the plan, man. There's some amazing fishing up there too. And, and uh, like what Greg, if you were to like, if you were to think about some things that you would want to do this year, I mean, what, what comes to mind, like of your kind of fishing that is, is something that you would like to tell that story, something that, I mean, I would imagine that it's something that means a lot to you. That's a special kind of fishing to you. And you want to, you want to, you know, share that with Jared and share that with the world. Yeah. I mean, you know, Jared and I have actually had the opportunity to, to fun fish uh, as friends in Louisiana before and, uh, it, it would just, I would love to be able to tell that story about how special the fishery is that we have here in Louisiana and 
not so much just the fishing, but the culture, uh, what goes in, you know, behind the scenes, the food, uh, the flair, the music, uh, the people that you get to hang out with. I mean, it's just a totally different atmosphere uh, than any other place you can go. So, uh, being able to tell that story, take Jared downtown, you know, get him a couple, uh, uh, hurricanes, hand grenades, stuff like that, uh, you know, would be fun, uh, after a fun day of fishing. And, um, uh, you know, I, I think Jared and I have talked about this before, you know, he, he may not care too much to catch the big redfish on fly, but I do know one thing he wants to do and that's to sight fish a big one with a, with a dead chunk of crab. So, um, <laughs> I'm going to, uh, I'm going to take him out there, put him in some beautiful water, big fish floating around him, And let's see if he can't sight fish one with a, with a, with a big live or dead blue crab. I think that'd be fun to watch. Bingo. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds pretty good. Sounds pretty good. What about the offshore stuff? Do you do any offshore, Greg? I do. Uh, I, I've done it before with some friends. I do mostly, uh, I have been out in the skiff and, and done some near shore stuff, uh, some rig fishing, snapper, uh, cobia, um, you know, amberjacks, stuff like that. But I, um, we have a pretty good conventional tarpon fishery, uh, in Louisiana, uh, during certain times of the year. So we've got a lot of options, um, you know, late summer, early fall. So I'd, I'd love to get Jared over here and get him out and do some of that stuff as well. Yeah. Well, on that conventional tarpon fishing, are, is anybody fly fishing for him up there or, or, or like, is there an area that you can do that or? You you can get them on fly, and there's definitely some areas uh, that are more consistent on fly. But our fishery is different than say the Keys or the Panhandle or Boca Grande, where they're not just swimming through and they stay on a consistent line. Our fish around here, they're constantly moving. They're they're moving with the bait. So you could find them in one area one day in the middle of nowhere, uh, see them free jumping around. They're in bait. And then the next day that bait's gone and the fish leave. So it's just hard to get a good pattern on them, but there are areas that they do consistently show up more. So they and, fish, and some people are catching them on fly. They fish with that. What is it? A coon pop? Is that what they call it? Uh, yeah, they fish, but you can actually throw, if, if you get them in the right situation in shallow enough water, you can throw plugs at them. Uh -huh. Um, you know, subsurface plugs, stuff like that, where you, you know, most of those guys, when they're trolling those coon pops, I mean, they're just, they're marking them in 25 to 40 foot of water and they're just trolling those coon pops through them. But, um, you can get them in less than 10 feet in some areas and you can throw plugs. That's when you can get them on fly. Uh, it's just, it's not as consistent as, as some areas. Hmm. That's cool. But, I remember but, the first time I ever saw one of those coon pops, I was, I was like, what is that? I said, that's what they, that's what all the boys catch tarpon on up here. How does how does that thing work? Is it it's all trolling? You don't throw those things at all? I've never fished with one. Not, I mean, I guess you I guess you could throw. But so from what I understand, there's there's two versions of coon pop, and what I understand is the original coon is I want to say like a two ounce gold spoon uh, trolled with you know a curly tail or something like that off the back. But I think that's you know, some people's version of it is basically what they're fishing in or what they used to fish in Boca Grand Pass, right. where it's just an early tail on a heavy weight with a circle hook and, and that's it. So most of them are just trolling it and, you know, they're trolling rip lines or they're trolling edges where these fish hang out. And, you know, some days those guys go out and they'll put up 20 fish. <laughs> um, just a matter if the fish are there or not. Yeah, when you hear somebody's putting up 20 fish, it's kind of like, hmm, I wonder if a coon pop would work in uh, Key West Harbor. <laughs> you know, that's the first thing I think about is, yeah. huh, let me see that thing again. Like one more time. Because, <laughs> I mean, that's all it takes is like you get something from up there and then you take it to Key West Harbor. They've never seen one of those things. Man, it'd probably be great. Or a bridge or something. I don't know. Seems like it would be. If, it, if they eat it one place, they would have to eat it in the other. Um what are you guys' plans on uh, on distribution? You mentioned that you were going to get Silver Kings out to a really big audience. Um, are you going to change anything? Are you going to do something new there? Uh, right. I'll, I'll take it. Yeah. Um, so uh, just in, in general, uh, you know, Jared production, you know, all of us, we've, we've done quite a bit of research on what's going on um, in regards to where TV is going versus digital. And, um, you know, the, the numbers don't lie. Um, TV numbers are down quite a bit, uh, over the last, you know, I'd say three to five years. And, uh, a lot of things are going, um, more digital. So, 
we are uh, going to take a, a big bite out of uh, what Waypoint can offer, and um, you know we're gonna we're gonna come in heavy with with some of the new Waypoint you guys are offer. Um, it's just the you know numbers speak for itself. Uh, from a sponsorship standpoint, uh, it's much easier for the sponsors to track those numbers <laughs> uh, on digital platforms than it is on TV. And um, with some of the things that that we've heard with what Waypoint's going, and I, I'm not sure if. You know, the deal with Samsung is something that is out in the open yet or not. But um, with the Waypoint app being on all new Samsung smart TVs, tablets and smartphones, it's just going to be a huge, huge, huge audience that, um, you know, Waypoint's going to be able to reach. And that's why we want to come in heavy uh, with Silver Kings on Waypoint for season seven. And so we're, we're excited. That's awesome. I'm really happy to hear it because we obviously go heavy there, too. And it has been it's been great for us. It's been um it's really been, I don't know, a lifesaver because the the conventional television model is it's tough, man. I mean, it, it's a it's a weird thing. Like it doesn't happen in other other uh, industries like this, but the numbers are going down of the number of people that are watching, and the the price keeps going up. That doesn't seem to make any sense, and it doesn't seem to be like a sustainable kind of a, a model anywhere that that you you would. You know, I'm going to give you less, but you're going to pay way more. And um, I don't know. That's that was that was a big kind of eye opener for for us. And then then with Waypoint, we've been doing we've been doing great. But that'll be great because uh, you know Silver Kings and our show and many other shows that are on Waypoint are similar similar type content. And it's always been my um, kind of opinion that when you when you kind of put similar type shows together and create a block where somebody can sit down for you know, two hours and kind of watch similar type of, of content, everybody does better. Like that's how it used to be on ESPN. Like when, when, you know, you would have saltwater Sunday and it would be like Walker's K and Spanish fly. And then like we had a little mini show on there and there was George Poveromo and there were other, other, you know, there's like a bunch of saltwater shows. And so they built this big audience around like a, a block and um, that's happening at waypoint too. That's, that's good. I'm glad to hear you guys are going to do that. That's awesome. Absolutely. We're excited. Yeah. And what about, um, what about like, um, um, the production, everything staying the same there? Yeah. Yeah. The production side, uh, still, still with Marty and James. Um, I'm going to be the host. Um, Marty and James are just, they, they make the show, right. You know I mean? They're, they're, just put it in their hands and, you know what I mean? And, and don't, don't question anything and let them go ahead and do what they do. And I, as long as I can try to keep doing what I've been doing and just, you know, trying to get the shots they want or the fishing that they want, I think we would still have the same kind of level that we've been at. Yeah. Yeah. They're great. I mean, those guys have always been, they've always been top notch. I mean, I've known both of them for a long time and, and fantastic. Good choice. Good choice of, uh, of talent for you. Um, what about anything, anything else like with, with silver Kings, do you guys like feel any sort of, of, of responsibility as you, you know, you have a, you have a good audience already. You have uh, a good following and, and you have a show that's filmed in, in beautiful places. Do you feel like there's any responsibility to like bring in the conservation aspect? And if so, kind of what, maybe your plans are, what, what do you see as kind of the biggest kind of issues that you, you know, in your own mind right now? Um, well, we've, we've worked with the last two years with BTT um, as being our, you know, conservation, uh, which has been, has been phenomenal. I mean, I've, um, I have had the, you know, the pleasure of fishing Tom Davidson and, and, you know, the starter. And then I fish a lot of the, you know, people that sit on the board and, so I've always been around them for the last seven or eight years. And, um, you know, I really truly love, you know, what they've been doing. Uh, my passions have always been those three of that, um, hopefully moving forward and, um, um you know, kind of just putting it out there where, you know, everything, uh, the new science and they've been coming now where they've, um, been able to figure out the spawning in, in you know, in, in, in tanks and, and, and kind of doing that and, trying to, you know, keep, keep pushing uh, that and getting it out there as many people as we can when it comes to, you know, 
just basically handling fish. You know, that's the main thing. People don't, it's handling those species that's so important. You know, everybody wants when they catch a permit or a bonefish or a tarpon. I, you know, I have clients every day. It's their first one. Everybody wants that glory shot, you know, and, but, you know, mishandling them is the problem, you know, where putting your fingers in, in locations where, you know, you don't realize it's your first one, but that harms them or putting too many hands on top of a bonefish and taking that slime coating off them, you know, and those are the kind of the big things that BTT and their little segments they've done in the last two years. It just kind of puts that out there to everybody. And, you know, hopefully people start to just, you know, be more cautious when they catch fish. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, just to kind of add to that, I think, you know, BTT has been known, I would say, you know, since their startup as more of a fly fishing oriented um, conservation uh, uh, company. And, you know, I think that there's a lot of people in the conventional world that may not know about Bonefish Tarpon Trust because they've gravitated more towards the fly angler. And, you know, that's a vision I think that we have moving forward with where we're going with the show and incorporating, you know, a bit more conventional into the show uh, to to reach that broader audience uh, and and to bring light to uh, the fact that, you know, it's not just a a, a law thing and want bone tarpon and permit to be available to all types of fishing, Um, you know, uh, conventional fly, bait, you know, however you're fishing for them. Um, I, you, know, you should get involved with an organization like, like BTT or, you know, uh, captains for clean water, uh, you know, somebody that's going to help preserve, uh, what we still have. Um, and you know, it, it, it's been on a decline for, for years and with the work of, of bonefish tarpon trust and captains for clean water, I'm sure Jared can speak to it, um, very highly, but I'm sure he's seen, uh, positives come from it and the numbers of bonefish increase. Uh, and even the last few years, seeing the water clarity increase and get better uh, in the Everglades, uh, at least from what I've seen uh, fishing out there. So, um, you know, the, the people that get involved and the money that's raised through these uh, through these companies, um, it, 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 it works. And I think it's better to have more people know about it, not just fly, but conventional uh, minded people as well. So we're, that's what. Uh, yeah. It's interesting, Jer- Jared. What do you what do you think's going on with uh, what do you think the status of the Isla Mirada bone fishery is right now? I mean, <clears throat> you know, we had the big fish there, and then they kind of disappeared, and then people are starting to catch more. What What do you think? What do you think? Where is it right now in your mind? Well, I mean, I I would say that bone fishing in general has definitely just gone great, great over the last four years. Um, there was something about, and obviously you, you know this as well, because you spent a lot of time there. It's something in my mind that there was a food source in that location of downtown that made these fish get the size large. You know, um, I mean, there was always big fish caught up in in in, in Biscayne Bay, and which I think is now the last place of the big fish. You know, the, especially the, the the further east part of the bay um, from you know sands cut up. Um, there's still some, some big fish around that zip code. And, you know, you see them on different times on the different locations on the side of the bay and all that. But, um, I don't know if, if these fish, I mean, they've, they've come back in the last four years. I'm not saying they're not going to get size large, um, which mean, you know, 10 pounds plus I, I could say, you know, I, I spent a lot of time bone fishing. Um, and I still love it. And I have not um, caught a true double digit fish um, in two years. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people I see on social media saying, oh, 10 pounds. But, you know, in my mind, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a solid fish, but it's probably a more realistic eight. Um, you know, a 10 pound fish is, 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 a, is a big fish. Um, but I feel really positive about our bone fishery. You know, I feel like on, on certain days when everything's definitely aligned, you know, it's not um, nowadays not uncommon if you have a good angler in good conditions to catch, you know, 12, 13, 14 bonefish on fly in a day. Um, and that's back when I was catching big fish and you were catching big fish, you never caught more than two or three right. bonefish. You know, you if you went in the back region of Alamada, you could catch numbers. But, you know, it was more if you stayed around downtown Alamada, you were catching, you know, two or three. And now they're going to be seven, eight to 15 pounds. 
Um, but now when I spend days there, I'm seeing, you know, a high number of schools. That's the one thing, big schools of them, you know, of, of little fish, anywhere from two to four or five pounds. Um, and not, you can just always tell it's not the same school. You know, you get into an area, it's not the same. It's not one school working, one or whatever. It's, it's, no, there's numerous schools. So, you know, I do believe the fishery is coming back, um, especially in the lower keys. Yeah. I know you spent. <clears throat> yeah. That's what I was going to ask you, like what you thought was going on in Key West. Like, I mean, when I first started guiding in Key West, there were very few bonefish. I mean, you had to go up to like Sugarloaf, Big Pine area to, to, to catch many bonefish. And they're just, nobody was really catching many. I mean, there were a couple of little schools that you could find and you had to be exactly on the right tide and everything had to be just perfect and you could find them, but there just weren't that many and, and no one was catching them. And then, you know, you think, Oh, well, when the Isla Mirada guys get down here during the, you know, the, the slam tournament, they'll show us how to catch them, you know, it, but they wouldn't catch them either. They just weren't there. They, I mean, I'm now I look back and I'm like, they weren't there. Like we were, we were looking in all the right places. They just weren't there. And now they are like, there's a lot of them. And, uh, I just kind of wonder like what happened there to, to, to bring so many in like, and I don't know. It's, I mean, it's a great thing to see. It's, it's a horrible thing to see the big ones kind of go into a decline in Isla Mirada, but yeah, I just always kind of wonder like what happened. And sometimes you can talk to scientists, you can talk to other people, but sometimes it's the, it's the, eyes on the ground that kind of kind of make at least make sense to me using the lower keys just because the gall and are so close to each other you know and up in almirada it's more what i consider like the arm you know you don't get as much um flow which always was kind of like made me realize that there was a food source for the big ones there because they stayed in you know, on an a average tide with the average wind, you know, you would put the push pole in the mud and you would watch it slowly, you know, go with the current. And then when you go into lower keys and you push it within seconds, you don't even see the mud, mud, you know, puff. So it was always easier to find bonefish in Almorada because if they were mudding, you know, they would hold and drag the muds longer to be able to put your eyes on the muds before you put the eyes on the fish. Um, but I, I do believe after fishing with, you know, uh, all these guys that are, you know, super involved with BTT is that, you know, I think the, the banding of the netting in Cuba and other locations, um, you know, seven years, whatever it's been, um, really kind of seeing a bounce off that and seeing fish moving, coming through, um, you know, when they're spawning and getting kind of flowed into the lower region um, of the Keys. And I mean, those guys now, they're, like you were saying, even in the summertime, it was hard to find bow and vision key West. Those guys are catching them in the wintertime, oh, yeah. like Key Largo, you know, like in, you know, and down here is like, man, I'm watching, you know, the, and the guides in the lower keys are just phenomenal, right? Like I, you never see the lower keys guides come up our way. You always see the upper <laughs> keys guide down their way. Right? Because from like July on, I spend July to October down the lower keys. And, uh, um, change for me. I love it. It's, it's the fishing phenomenal baby tarpon permit, bone, everything around it. But, you know, you'll always kind of look back and, you know, and like, okay, maybe in the, in the winter months, these guys would come up here to change it, change it up and go red fish snook fishing. But why would they leave their backyard now when they're catching six, seven bonefish on fly with big kudas? And then when the weather, you know, is, it's, it's, it's calm, they're catching permits. Yeah, you're exactly right about what's going on in the lower keys. I mean, those guys are catching a lot of bonefish, a lot of them. Oh, yeah. And uh, it's good to see. It really is. But it wasn't always that way. And then you see other things no. like, you know, there used to be uh, mutton snappers tailing on the flats, which was a little bit before my time. And then that all of a sudden just came to a close, like, boom, done. And people are like, oh, yeah, we used to do that. Like, when? Like, two years ago. And then what happened? Like, You'd think that you would see like a, a few less, but then it was all of a sudden there were none. And that's a weird thing. I never got an answer about that. that that's the one thing about big bonefish, you know, in all Rada. I remember like, I remember, you know, I got the tail end and I always talk to the legends and, you know, I love just, you know, kind of going back and like, Oh, one guy's like, you should have been here in the seventies. And next one, you should have been here in the late nineties. And then, you know, I started, you know, big bone fishing around like 2005. And I remember, the day and I, I talk with Tim Mahaffey and I talk with the other couple of 
guys uh, about it that, you know, are true friends and, and, and people I spend time with, but like that ocean side of like whale Harbor, snake Creek, it was like overnight. Like one day I went, I was fishing them. And then I felt like I came back the next week and there wasn't one to be found. And that now, breaks my heart. How, how soon after that cold front are you talking about? Did, do you, do you, can you pinpoint those fish kind of disappearing like that on that day that they were there and then they're not? And does that, is that associated with the cold front? No, you know, it was, it was, that was two, it was 2013 is when I remember, you know, um, and then there were still the big fish around, you know, shell Billy's Lake mm -hmm. and some on the wash mm -hmm. and that whole Lake Nevada region. But I'm, it, that was overnight, you know, it was like, it was just all of a sudden, you know, it didn't matter from the north side of Snake Creek to the south side of Whale Harbor, Tea Table, Indians coming in. It's the right. It always it never matter or the tide. It just mattered what, what triangle or what fishing. And um, it just all one day, just they weren't there. Yeah. You know, and I, I still feel I still feel like, you know, every, you know, every few months I pull it just to <laughs> just to bring back old times and. And hope, you know, all of a sudden see a, a, a mud. And usually when I do, it's like a bonnet head mudding or a stingray. But, you know, hopefully one day that, um, but you know what's funny though, talking about it is that now I see permit there mm. more than I've ever. Heard. Interesting. That's super interesting. I always thought, kind of wondered, like, as soon as, uh, you know, when the big bonefish kind of moved out, and you weren't seeing those as much. All of a sudden, there were like redfish in all the places where there were those big bonefish, and they were doing kind of a similar thing, like just rumbling down these banks. And and it's like, well, I guess there's food here, and the bonefish aren't here, so the redfish immediately come and take over that. And I wonder if that's what's going on with the permit, or or if it's just, I don't know. It's it's just a weird thing, and and it just kind of. I don't know. I don't mean to, I don't mean to harp on like it was, it was really good, you know, so f you should have been here, you know, in all these other years. Cause that's not what I'm, what I'm doing at all. I just, I find it interesting that, that there's this ebb and flow and change in the fishery and like, maybe, maybe these are the heyday for, for the Key West bone fishing, but you know, it wasn't always that way. And it used to be that you couldn't catch any at all down there, hardly. I mean, it was really, really hard. And now it's really good. And then there's like this just kind of ebb and flow of 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 what happens. And you always, I don't know, it's just a kind of interesting to, to, to talk to other people that have kind of seen that same thing and then compare notes as to what what might have happened. Well, I mean, I, I, I still believe, though, you know, the fishery is, you know, is, is, is great. I mean, the park fishing is you know, uh, going back to what Greg was talking about, like, you know, captain for clean water, our water, you know, in 2015, if you went out and caught six or got six redfish shots, you know, you were doing something great. You know, the water was hard to see. You had to find clean water. Um, you know, there wasn't many fish around, but now, I mean, going out and, and, and park fishing reds and snook, um, it's, it's, it's the best I've ever seen it. You know, it's, it's phenomenal. And not just, you know, okay, they're all in one location. I mean, it doesn't matter if you were from Sandy all the way back in the bites, you know, in between every island. And, um, you know, I, I've talked to a lot of guides that fish a lot of different zip codes and they all feel the same way about it. Mm -hmm. And all those small snook and, you know, people nowadays, like if you only caught 20 snook, it's, it's a slow day, yeah. you know, uh, that these big, all these fish that we see moving around, are going to turn into seven, eight, 10 pounders, um, you know, five years from now. Yeah, I hope so. I think it, I think it will happen. I don't know. I have, I have very positive feelings about, about the, the fishery right now. Greg, what about, what about in your area of you, you know, one of the things that I noticed so much when I was fishing up there was every time I went and mostly my fishing in your area would be around Venice. Um, I'm not sure where you're, where you're spending most of your time, but, um, there was a time when I was spending a pretty good bit of time up in Venice and every time I would go, it would be just a, a little bit different, you know, like the, there was this, this, uh, kind of erosion of the coastline going on. And I didn't know if that was a good thing or a bad thing or a natural thing or, or what, but, um, you know, the, what are the things that are going on in your, in your area that you might bring light to in, in this new season of silver Kings? 
Yeah, I'll tell you what. I mean, you, you touched on erosion. Um, it, it's a, it's not a good thing, and we're losing way too much marsh way too quick. Um, I want to say the numbers are something like we're losing a football field every 10 seconds or something like that of, of coastline in Louisiana, which is insane. So there's been some organizations out there that are starting to uh, plant quite a bit of uh, black mangrove uh, out on some of the shorelines, and they're doing some, some coastal uh, restoration. Um, we, we've got a chain of barrier islands, uh, you know, from basically uh, just south of Mississippi all the way down to the mouth of the, of the river, uh, the chandeliers. And with a lot of the storms, those islands have gotten either washed away um, or, you know, uh, those, those barrier islands act as a barrier to our marsh. So uh, they've been doing some restoration work with those islands to help keep uh, the erosion down. Uh, they've been doing some stuff with a lot of the dredged uh, pipeline channels uh, that create a lot more current going through the marsh in areas that, you know, help with, don't help with the erosion, but uh, they make it go faster. So uh, they're trying to block some of those channels off, um, you know, but we're just losing way too much uh, too quick. And they're doing some diversion work where they're trying to let the natural sediments of the river uh, come out uh, to try and gain some more marsh, but we're just not gaining it as quick as we're losing it. So it's it's a, it's scary to see where it's going to be in ten years, but um, they're doing as much as they can to to keep it, uh, you know, while it's while we have it. Now, when you um, say when you say they, who, what, what organizations are kind of working on that? You know, the 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 Corps of Engineers is yeah. is doing some stuff. Um, you know, we're they're 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 working with uh, the government to try and figure out, uh, you know, where to put these diversions, to where you know we can gain as much marsh as we possibly can. Um, you know, we've got some uh, uh, some guide, uh, uh, the Louisiana Guides uh, Foundation, that you know they're trying to raise some money to. Uh, buy mangroves to plant them out in the marsh because the mangrove root system is a much stronger root system than the uh, Spartina grass that we that we have on most of the shorelines. And to be honest with you, we're you know down in Venice where you have the um, the roseo cane. I mean, it's an invasive species, and it, the root system is is not very good, and it just gets wiped away with even a bad southeast wind. So. Um, we're doing as much as we can. Um, I wish there was more people that would get involved uh, because it is probably in the world period. And um, I would, I would hate to see my kids not be able to experience you know, a fraction of, of what I've been able to experience since I've been here. Yeah. So you say they're, they're planting black mangrove. That seems really North. Mm -hmm. Like, can it live there? I guess it can. It, it can. Yeah. It can. can plant, um, mangroves and i want to stay planted over a couple hundred thousand black mangroves uh on the coast of louisiana i don't know the exact numbers but one of the guys that i work with uh lucas Bissett, um he's he's started that project and he's done a lot of stuff uh through orvis and uh they've raised a lot of money to to do as much as they can and he, there's there's actually a lot of of natural black mangrove in areas further west um like west of the mississippi that they grow naturally so they're just, they're trying to plant them in areas where, you know, they don't have as many of them and do as much as they can uh, to, to preserve what we have. Well, I like it when, you know, there's like, like with the captains for clean water kind of thing and the issues that we've had I always was, was very optimistic because they, they were pointing out that there is a solution. And then now, like, as Jared pointed out, like Flamingo looks better than, I, I can ever remember it. I think it, it's, I agree with you a hundred percent. It's as beautiful as I've ever seen it. The fishing is fantastic. And, uh, you know, a lot of that is, is dead in line with, with what the plan was. Um, and, and it wasn't captains for clean water necessarily that, that created the plan. The plan was already out there. It was just that nobody was, was doing what was, you know, planned a long time ago. And, uh, it, but I was always pretty optimistic that there was a there was a good solution, and I hope that that's the way for uh, for your area up there with the with the mangrove and and being able to stabilize that shoreline. Because man, I sure do love fishing up there where you are. That's it's it's just an amazing it's, place. It's, it's really cool. I mean, one one other thing that we're having some pretty big issues with right now, and I think that 
there's some there's some headway being made is with the uh the pogi boats up here and um you know they're basically they're they're going on airplanes and they are spotting these giant pogie schools during the peak spawning time of when our bull redfish spawn um they're allowed so much bycatch um in the pogies that they that they bring in and that bycatch is most of the time mature bull spawning size redfish so you know i hate to see it every year um september time frame you'll go run some of the beaches you know uh, west of venice and you see nothing but dead bull redfish littering the beaches and it's all from overconsumption of of these pogie boats and they're coming in too shallow and uh, they're they're putting the hurt on our bull redfish population, which y- you hope in the future isn't going to hit um, uh, you know the spawning size fish that uh, you know, that help produce our, our redfish population. It's um, it's not good. Wow. Well, I hope that uh, I hope that you can bring light to to some of those issues and and make a make a difference in in uh, absolutely in that. But, uh, man, I'm, I'm happy for you guys. I think that, um, you guys are both awesome dudes and, and, uh, definitely keeping family first. And I'm really happy to, to see you getting silver Kings going and, or, or re going and then, uh, partnering up. It looks like it's going to be a, be a great project for both of you. And, uh, I look forward to seeing it on waypoint. Um, you got anything you want to leave us with? No, no, I just want to thank you Tom, for having us. And uh, for, you know, uh, inviting us on this, it's awesome. Love listening to your guys' podcast. And uh, obviously, I've been watching your shows for a long time. So so I'm humbled by it. Thank you. Oh, man. Thanks for doing it. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. I, I, I second that. Um, you know, we're, we're excited with where the show's going. And I, I would say at some point in time, we may have to get you on there and put you in front of our camera. Say the word, man. You can do Say the word. I'd be honored. I'd be honored. I just hope I, I wouldn't. I, Jared would make me nervous. He'd be like, there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one. Why aren't you casting? I, I don't I don't know. I'm a little nervous. I'm used to being on the back of the boat. No, I, I'd, I'd love it, man. That'd be awesome. I, uh, I certainly know. Um, I know more about Jared than he knows that I know about him because we fish with. Uh, he, he has inherited some of my very best, finest customers in the world and some of my best friends and and they tell me all kinds of stories so um they're all good they're all good oh um, there'll be there'll be there'll be some that aren't so good but, i'm sure yeah. there's everybody's got everybody's got some that aren't so good but uh <laughs> i don't know man uh you, you guys are doing awesome and uh i really look forward to seeing more super grand slams uh i i, I want to see you top that that's what i want to see i want to see you the bar's high bar is high do it we're gonna do it (laughs) all right fellas i'm gonna let you go i appreciate it let's do this again and uh i'll see you guys soon thank you absolutely all right appreciate it thank you see ya